astronomy show not a cooking show no oh um, yeah 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 sure sure i realize that cooking is chemistry chemistry is biology but but i no no i'm not the cooking companion i'm not the cooking companion i'm not the cooking companion i'm the cosmic companion the recipe for life or Ancient Life of La Mode with Jamie Green, The Possibility of Life. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we are looking at how to cook up life on a planet. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with Jamie Green, author of the new book, The Possibility of Life. So, how does life form on a new planet? Well, chemicals and energy, that's how. You know what else you can do with chemicals and energy? Cook food. That's what. Excuse me while I put on the chef's hat. Now, if you're looking to cook up life on an early career planet, here's what you're going to need for this recipe. An abundance of amino acids, a supply of sugars, a quantity of nucleotides, at least a little lipids, water, and energy. Now first, let's talk about amino acids. These guys are the building blocks of proteins which are essential for life as we know it. Vegetarian sources of amino acids include nuts, berries, beans, almonds, or... oranges. Kinda like these tangerines right here. Now, we're going to let these sit in for the primitive amino acids. You know what? Let the orange thing slide, okay? We're already thinking that they're, that they're primitive amino acids. Now, the first amino acids may have formed through a process called abiogenesis, where simple organic compounds combine and react with energy, such as lightning strikes or ultraviolet radiation from the sun. The molecules and structures within foods can radically change while they cook. Why, that's the whole reason we cook food. I know, exactly. So, next we have the sugars. These are vital for providing energy to cells and making up the structure of DNA and RNA. Laboratory experiments reveal that simple sugars can form from basic organic compounds. Now, here we are going to have sugars represented by, well, um, sugars. In this case, cane sugar. Uh, about 95% of this, that's actually sugar, is, uh, is a disaccharide, meaning it's made up from glucose and fructose in this case. Sweet. What a wonderful feeling, more than I can explain. Now, nucleotides are another essential component of life, making up the building blocks of DNA and RNA. You remember that whole A, T, C, G, and sometimes U thing from high school bio? Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Researchers have found that nucleotides can form uh, within meteorites, suggesting that they may have been delivered to Earth by comets and asteroids. Now, these bits of genetic code can be found in nearly every bit of anything we call food. This is the wild card. So, I don't know. Let's throw in some cherries, shall we? All right, and then we have lipids. These are typically fatty or waxy substances. Oh, I don't know. A little bit of butter should do nicely. Now, these are important for making up the membranes that surround cells and maintain their structure. Uh, lipids can form spontaneously in water and they may have arisen in the early oceans of Earth. Some primitive life forms called extremophiles thrive on minerals uh, from seafloor vents, which you're going to represent with a dash of salt. <laughs> That's more than a dash. Now you mix all of these ingredients together with some water, 
and you have the basic chemical building blocks of life. But like most recipes, life needs energy and time to come to fruition. Or in this case, fruit issue. Ah, you see what I did there? <laughs> While our primitive planet has a hot time for a while, we welcome Jamie Green to the show, talking about her new book, The Possibility of Life. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Jamie Green. She is a science writer whose new book, The Possibility of Life, just came out. And it talks about the wondrous diversity of life which could surround us in the cosmos. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So, first of all, I'd like to know what brought you into a life of science and writing and education. <laughs> Give us your origin story. It's really hard because it goes back like farther than I can imagine, you know, um, I, you know, I know when I was maybe like five years old, my, I remember my dad showing me the constellations in the sky. And when I was just as little, my grandfather, on my mom's side took me to watch a, uh, a lunar eclipse. Oh, yeah. And I think it's just always been in me. And it's obviously, you know, you can't force a kid to be interested in those sorts of things, but I really responded to it. I loved learning about the natural world, thinking about space, learning about science. It's just something I've been interested in my whole life. And then I've also always been interested in writing. It took me a really long time to think about putting those together. I was in graduate school in my mid twenties and I was studying creative nonfiction. And the first semester, one of my professors mentioned that there was a science writing group on campus for science writers and scientists who write. And I was like, wait a second, I love science. I love writing. Why am I not writing about science? And it, it really should have, but it just took that long. <laughs> right, right. And so what, what were some of your earliest attempts, your earliest works at, when you're at science, science writing? Science, yeah. Well, one of the very first things I did was actually the, the very earliest seeds of this book. Um, in my second semester of graduate school, all of the nonfiction students had to take a semester long research seminar to learn, you know, research techniques. And we had to pick a topic to write about that semester. And I wanted to choose the Voyager Golden Record, you know, the like little message in a bottle records that were attached to the Voyager probes when they were launched in the 70s. Um, and my professor said, go bigger, do aliens. I was like, okay, that's a lot bigger. And so that was some of my first writing about science. I um, I took a class in the astronomy department, like an undergrad astronomy class to learn about exoplanets and biology and the scientific way that these questions are thought about. Okay. And I took every science writing class that was available to me, which was very few because I was in the creative writing program, you know, studying creative nonfiction. But I took one in the creative writing program, looking at creative nonfiction ways of writing about science. I took a science journalism class. Um, but from the start, I was almost entirely writing about astronomy because that was my biggest love, my first, you know, my biggest scientific passion. And it took, that was, I guess, 11 years ago, that class, and, and now the book is coming out. <laughs> wow. So as your book so aptly points out, life out in the cosmos is probably far more diverse than we can hope to imagine. Um, and um, so 
we're very, very likely, it seems, to find our first good evidence for life on other worlds in the coming years. And my first question is about that is, there is how are we going to find this life? I mean, we could find evidence for uh, chemical markers and atmospheres of exoplanets. We might find it in the oceans of alien worlds. Um, or we might even get a radio signal, you know, intercept a radio signal. How, how do you think it's going to, how do you think it's going to unfold? It's tricky because I think that, you know, a radio signal requires that there be intelligent life and intelligent life that develops the same kind of technology that we do. So that obviously is a subset of all life on other worlds, if we imagine that it's out there. So in that case, the, in that sense, the odds are not very good for a signal compared to other ways of discovering it, but a signal could be much more decisive. Like if we detect a biosignature in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, that's not a definitive discovery. That's It's a hint. That's a, well, on Earth, this sort of signature looks like it's coming from life, so we should, you know, it's going to open the door to more investigation. Um and that's like decades, you know, it's too far away to send a probe. If, you know, we discover something with JWST, that's just one section that's, you know, infrared. But if we want to find confirmation, we might need a telescope that's observing an ultraviolet or something. So, okay, we have to like, it's decades and decades to build and send out that sort of mission. And even still, like, it's going to be incredibly hard to get a definitive answer. Within the solar system, we have much better odds in that sense because we're capable of sending probes to Mars, to ocean moons, you know, drilling under the surface of Europa and seeing what's what's under all that ice. Um, those are still really challenging missions. That also would mean that we're counting on life arising twice within the same solar system. That would be very lucky. And we have to be extra careful to figure out if it is actually a distinct form of life from what's on Earth. Have we accidentally contaminated the probe? Or if it's on Mars, there is a possibility that life arose first on Mars and was, um, you know, shot out in meteorites when there were lo there was lots of bombardment going on in the early solar system. And life could have hitched a ride on a rock from Mars to Earth and found a friendlier habitat and flourished here. So it's possible that if we find Martian life and it's chemically identical or chemically very similar to life on Earth, it could be really hard to know if we're looking at two distinct origins of life, which is like, to me, the most important question, because I don't care as much if life can survive on Mars. I want to know if life has arisen in the cosmos more than once. That's to me, is the big question. That is the big question. Yeah. And, um, so this also brings the opposite um, idea to mind, which is how will the discovery of life on other worlds affect humans? Yeah, I I really don't know. I mean, when I was writing the book, you know, I, I spent the last few years working on it. But I was writing it in 2020 when in the fall of 2020, there came word that a biosignature had been detected in the atmosphere of Venus. And I remember thinking, okay, okay, I'm like taking notes. This is exactly, it's happening. Whether or not that panned out, which it didn't, I got to see in the moment what it felt like for there to be an announcement of we might have found something. Mm. What I discovered is that people were really excited for like a day on Twitter. And then they go about their lives, um, you know, while the scientists are taking months to reanalyze the data to try to confirm or poke holes in it, you know, that slow process of confirmation, because unless someone sends us a message that says, hello, earthlings, we're over here on another planet, what's up? Like, even a technological signal requires a lot of confirmation and investigation to eliminate all other possibilities. So. I don't know. I mean, to me, it feels like it would be hugely meaningful, but it's not going to be someone who can like communicate with odds are, you know, even if it's a signal, if it's across hundreds of light years, that's very, very slow pen pals. Um, 
So I don't know. And also something I found really interesting in my research is that there have been times on earth for centuries where people felt sure that there was life on other worlds. Until we sent the first lander to Mars in the 70s, some scientists thought that when the, the lander touched down, it was going to find grass. It was going to find microbes. It was going to find abundant life. You know, it's only as we've learned more and more about the planets in the solar system and exoplanets and the universe at large that we've come to really think that we're looking for evidence that we're alone for a long time, it was, uh, that we're not alone. For a long time, it was just taken for granted and people just kind of live their lives. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now, what a, I have to say that your book is just so engaging. I just had... I, I, I literally you. had trouble putting this thing down. Ah, okay. Thank you. But you really got something going with, I love the fact that you talk in this book about what I consider to be Octavia Butler's masterwork. Ah, oh, yes. Xenogenesis yes. slash Lilith's Brood. Yes. I've read Parable of the Sower. This is... Yes. This is a remarkable, remarkable book. Yeah, you're with me. I love it. Yeah. So I would love for you to just, if you could, just without too many spoilers, you know, just talk a little yeah. bit about about the storyline and the Unkali and um, how the, how that work influenced your work. Yeah, that, that was a really exciting book to read because of all the sci-fi that I write about the book, some of it is books that I've loved my whole life. You know, Contact, The Sparrow, um, the N.K. Jemisin book, books that I talk about. Like, these are just books that I've always loved and I was excited to write about. But there were other books that I read for the first time as research for my book. And it was so exciting when I found something like dawn where I was like oh this is not only really good and really fun to read but this is fascinating to write about it's like this is this is good I need this so mm -hmm. I write about dawn which is the first book in the xenogenesis series um and it's about a woman named Lilith who wakes up on an alien ship and it turns out that the ship is in orbit around earth um, most of the planet and humanity has been destroyed by nuclear war. This is not spoiler. This is like what happens right, right, before. Right, right, and yeah, she yeah. and a very few other human survivors are being held sort of in stasis and woken up every so often to try to be communicated with. Um, and so she wakes up like when, when we really get going with the book, she's been on the ship for like 200 and something years, but just awake for little bits of it. And she meets these aliens, the only, Onkali. I had to learn how to pronounce a lot of alien words for my actual <laughs> book, but I've already lost some of it. Um, and they are to me just a fascinating imagining of like a very alien alien. Now Lilith can still communicate with them. They are still bipedal. They have a head and arms and a body. I think they might have a second set of arms that just come out on special right, occasions. Yeah. Um, but they speak a language that Lilith learns their language. They learn English. Um, they, there are a lot of commonalities, but they are also fundamentally different. Um, and this was what I was so excited about in terms of what I was writing about. So the Onkali, rather, they define themselves as traders. And Lilith asks them, what do you trade? And they say, ourselves. And she says, can you like slaves? And they say, no, 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 ourselves. Because what they mean is their genetic code. that they evolve and develop as a species by encountering alien species, getting to know their DNA, which is something that the Onkali um, have an aptitude for, and saying, oh, they have this ability, we could use that. And they also say, we have this ability, we think they need that. And what they end up saying is that the Onkali um, are acquisitive. They trade and improve by that sort of directed back and forth, whereas humans and all life on Earth, they say, are hierarchical. And I found that fascinating because it seemed like a narrative manifestation of evolution by competition, you know, survival of the fittest, that that's about hierarchy, whereas the Onkali are clearly evolving by acquisition and selection of new genes in a more directed way. So it was like this little scientific subtext in like extreme 
extremely cutting, readable, fascinating novel. Um, but I'm, I always had my eye on like little, you know, what's going to be especially fruitful for my book as well, even if it's not the main thematic point of the book. Right, right. I, I just loved the whole idea of the acquisition and um, I'm going to try not to give this away, but what, <laughs> but what the Uncali consider to be the human race's greatest talent. Yeah. If you haven't yeah. read the book, yeah. it's not what you think it is. <laughs> no, it, and that's also really interesting because like a big theme that I saw as I was working in sci-fi and I have like was also reading like scholarship about this is that we love using alien stories to tell us about humanity. You know, the aliens find us and say, oh, you're a particularly imaginative species or you're a very loving species or you're a very whatever species, you know. And in Star Trek, it's like the Klingons are warlike and the Vulcans are logical. So what are humans? But, you know, I hadn't really thought about Dawn as another version of that. of Like, well, here's actually your talent, which is um, not. Yeah. Like you said, not one of those. Um, it's not an answer we would be looking for. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And I'm, one of the things I've really been interested in lately is um, changes in how we are trying to understand the communication of animals here on Earth. Yeah. You know, we were trying for a lot, lot of researchers for a long time, we're trying to get animals to speak to humans, like Coco the mm. gorilla learning sign language. Um, but now that seems to be turning on its head where it's like, okay, and I think this started with Jane Goodall, you know, studying chimpanzees in the wild. Um, so we're starting to learn now and look more now at how animals are doing their natural communication with each other and trying to understand that. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how does that study, as well as what other knowledge we've gained about animals here on Earth, teach us about what we may find out in outer space it definitely tells us that there are very alien ways of thinking one of the things i thought was really fascinating that i learned in my research was that dolphins don't have object permanence if you put an object in a bucket that they can't sonar their way through they don't know where the object has gone and we think of that as like so fundamental human babies learn that before they're like two years old pick a boot Exactly. Right. Exactly. And dolphins seem so intelligent. And we think of them as maybe like the closest we have to a non-human intelligence on earth, but they can't find a thing that you put in a bucket, but it's because they don't need to. There aren't opaque buckets in their lives, you know, like underwater that doesn't happen. And, you know, when you think about a dolphin's abilities and their worldview, it's just so radically different. And it has proven much harder to understand their ways of communication, their ways of understanding the world. They have all of these surprises for us because their intelligence is so different. And so that's even on earth. So then we think, and, and we have like a relatively recent common ancestor with them. You know, they're not fish. They're like as related to us as cows are, maybe more. So on the one hand, that makes us think that alien intelligence could be very, very different, not someone we're going to easily have a conversation with. On the other hand, if the intelligent aliens that we're thinking about hold a similar role in their ecosystem that, as we do, if they live on land opposed to water, if they walk instead of fly, you know, if they, um, even just that, just living on land versus living in water, if they use similar senses as we do, because maybe they, um, you know, also arose out of sort of uh, omnivorous predators, right? Like maybe they'll be more similar to us than a dolphin because they would be solving similar challenges in evolution that a dolphin, I mean, we live in a two-dimensional space, right? We walk mm -hmm. forwards and right. back, side to side. Dolphins can move in three dimensions. Just like thinking about how different that makes your spatial perception, your relationships, your awareness of the world, um, what water transmits versus what air transmits. I mean, it could go on and on. So point being, it might actually mean that we're looking for 
the analogs of humans on other worlds. So they might be more similar to us than dolphins are, even though we don't have that common evolutionary ancestry. That's so fascinating. Um, and so if you could have readers take away just one thought after reading this book, what would you hope it would be? Oof, that is a really hard question. Um, I hope that something in the book gives them a sense of wonder. And I know that's what we go to a lot of astronomy writing for, you know, oh, the, the cosmos is so vast, we are so small. You know, every time we see a new JWST picture, it's going, you know, 13 billion years back in time. And we do feel awe from that. But I hope that there's some sort of like smaller, more local kinds of connection that people can feel, whether it's with other life on Earth or understanding themselves as a human, as a thinking animal a little differently that um, I guess I hope that it helps people find moments of awe and connection within this world, not just the worlds that we're imagining elsewhere. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Jamie. It was great talking with you. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Excellent. And that was Jamie Green. And check out her new book, The Possibility of Life, available anywhere you get your awesome science books. <laughs> check it out. All right, so where can your planet get its ingredients? Surprisingly, many of them are delivered, at least in part, right to your planet's door. Comets and asteroids are loaded with all sorts of organic compounds, including amino acids, sugars, nucleotides, and lipids. So look for a planet with liquid water, preferably in the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot and not too cold for water. You want your ingredients to stir and mix around. That's tough to do using ice or steam. Not too hot and not too cold. Liquid water is just right for life. Now it's time to mix everything together. Just stir organic compounds into the water and add heat. Kind of like putting it into an air fryer for a few minutes. Starting occasionally, say, every five minutes for a total of 10 minutes at 425. Just let it get golden brown and delicious or let the oceans come alive with life. Whatever comes first. With a dash of luck, life should start to form in no time. Life thrives in even the most extreme environments on Earth, like the frozen desert of Antarctica which we are representing here with some ice cream. Life will find a way. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of unknowns here and there's no way to be sure of our final result. But uh, you know, that's what makes these recipes and science worth doing. It's, uh, it's kind of like home cooking. You never quite know what it is that you are going to get. Mmm. Delicious. Next week on Cosmic... Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to be talking about surviving extinction. We're going to be joined by Nat Geo's Catherine Williams talking about National Geographic's new work, Weird But True, Sharks! Make sure to join us starting on the 20th of May. Check out our other episodes at thecosmiccompanion.com. While you're there, sign up for our newsletter and never miss an episode. If you enjoyed this episode of the show, please comment, follow, share, and tell your friends about the show. You know, when you invite them over for some delicious ancient life a la mode. Mm-hmm. Clear skies. <laughs>